Um, just a, a quick thing, I guess I will uh, say a few words that I was going to say later, but uh, people are welcome to use the chat uh, if they would like. Uh, we're going to have three distinguished panelists speaking uh, from different perspectives. Um, and then uh, we'll hold the discussion. There should be plenty of time for questions and answers uh, afterwards. And we will take those questions both from the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and also, you're welcome to, to raise your hand and uh, we'll see uh, how that works. But hopefully, we will have plenty of time for everybody to get their questions answered. Oh, actually, uh, Ashlyn and I could be monitoring that for you, so you don't, have to, you don't have to do that. Now, I also want to, on behalf of the Public Health Museum, welcome everyone to this session tonight. I think it will be a, a very interesting and exciting discussion about a very important topic. And I want to recognize the Northeast Branch of the American Society for Microbiology for their support of the museum for many years, and in particular the support for our program on Hansen's disease, which includes this uh, session as well as a number of other video presentations and materials, as well as an exhibit uh, co-curated by Paul Johansson and Ashlyn Rickord Werner. Uh, so we, we hope that someday people will actually be able to come back to the museum in person uh, and see this, uh, but we, we are uh, providing a lot of the material online because uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the closing of the Penakees Island Leprosarium in Buzzards Bay. Massachusetts decided that it needed to isolate people with Hansen's disease in 1905 uh, and created this colony on the island. Uh, and uh, one of our hopes with this program is that we can uh, educate people about the fact that uh, isolating people with Hansen's disease like that was not necessary then and is certainly not necessary now. Uh, and that the real, the real disease is stigma. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be hearing about this this evening. So turn it back over to Paul. All right, thank you very much, Al. Um, just a, a quick word briefly about the three speakers so you know what's coming up. Uh, our first speaker is gonna be Jose Ramirez, who, um, as he will tell you, uh, was diagnosed with leprosy and has lived for many years uh, with it and has become an international advocate for uh, patients with the disease. Then we will turn things over to Dr. David Scollard, who's the former medical director uh, at Carville, Louisiana, which was the federal facility um, on the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, and he will give an uh, overview of the disease itself, technical aspect. He literally wrote the textbook on leprosy. Uh, and we're going to end with Ken Hartnett, who's a journalist um, who uh, in 1994 put together a documentary on Penikis and uh, very much look forward to what everybody has to say. I'll introduce each of them a little bit more individually. Um, so Jose Ramirez is now a social worker. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, at age 20 uh, while living in Laredo, Texas with leprosy. Um, and so he did um, spend time in Carville, Louisiana, which uh, in the late 60s was a federal facility for people with Hansen's disease. Um, he has written a, a wonderful autobiography that I strongly encourage people to read uh, called Squint, My Journey with Leprosy. And I'm, I'm hoping he will explain, I'm sure he will, a little bit about that title, where it comes from. Um, currently, he is the editor of the Star Magazine, which is a longstanding patient-run magazine out of Carville. It started, um, I believe, in the 30s. Is that right? Certainly by the 40s. Um, and it has an international circulation. So uh, it's, uh, their archives are online and um, maybe I will, um, while he's speaking, put a link in the chat uh, so people can um, check that out. Also wonderful resource. Um, uh, as people hopefully heard, this is being recorded uh, and will become part of the virtual portion of this exhibit. Um, I did, I, I was in Tewksbury this morning uh, and I, uh, 
was very pleased to see the exhibit. We've been planning it for a very long time. Uh, and also it's a, it's a piece of what they have on display. There are many different pieces of which this is just a part and the tours are really wonderful. So I encourage people to go to Tewksbury um, and take the tour. So with that, I will turn things over to Jose and uh, uh, very much appreciate all our panelists being here. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, uh, and welcome to all of the 116 participants. Hopefully by the end of the, this presentation, you will be able to go ahead and, and clarify a lot of the myths that exist about Hansen's disease. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Could you go ahead? Uh, the power of ignorance. I call it the power of ignorance because, uh, you know, you've, you've heard about the fact that uh, knowledge is power. Well, I think ignorance is more powerful, especially when it comes to this disease. So could you go to the next one, Paul? Uh, this is especially for you, Paul, because in the big inning, the Houston Astros usually come through and uh, win the big games. But in reality, you know, I wanted to go ahead and talk about Genesis, because in the beginning, uh, there's all these references to individuals who have a disease uh, that is referred to by the L word. And I don't wanna go ahead and use that L word. That's very offensive for me and for those of us who have cancer's disease, because even when you go ahead and spell it in reverse, it spells repel. So I don't wanna go ahead and do that. It's the only disease that is referenced in the Bible. So next one, because of, of that, uh, there's a, a perception from others as opposed to our own self-identity. Um, you know, I like to go ahead and be referred to, like Paul said, as a social worker, but also by, by my name, Jose Ramirez. I don't want to go ahead and be referred to as a patient. And for decades, I was a patient wherever I went, uh, including the International Congress on Leprosy, which uh, um, David is going to talk about, uh, hopefully, but, oh, you're a patient. No, I'm not a patient. I'm only a patient when I go see my own physician. But the thing is that um, we see ourselves in the mirror as being human beings. We don't see ourselves with the L word um, that is used so much in the, in the Bible. Anyway, if you go to the next one. Uh, so as a result, uh, you know, we have, I feel, go to the next one, Paul. I, am I, I feel that, that we constantly need to move forward, but at the same time, we need to be able to understand what has been behind us. I have a, a definition of stigma, and, and, and it's normally when sociologists and researchers use the word stigma, they come up with a full paragraph uh, that refers to that because they want to make sure that it is measurable in case they go ahead and do research. For me, it's a very simple thing. It is an act of rejection. It is an act of labeling. And it is uh, an unexplained fear of a person. When you go ahead and look at an individual who has been traumatized, who has been diagnosed, there's trauma involved. There's grief involved. Why? Because there's a lot of losses. There's a loss of routine. There's a loss of a future, perceived future. There's a loss of physical contact and there's a loss of support system, at least emotionally. So there are many losses that happen with the, when a, an individual is diagnosed, even today, because again, of what has happened in the past and the biases implicit in it or explicit that have occurred. So keep in mind that this is a, a traumatic uh, type of uh, diagnosis. Uh, the next slide, Paul, uh, like Pathalmus, like Pathalmus, <clears throat> next one is, uh, no, the one before that, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, like Pathalmus, uh, in, in my opinion, is a, well, it's, it's a word, it's a technical term that refers to the inability to blink, which happens to persons who are affected by the disease, who have experienced the disease, the nerve endings, uh, and, and the eye area will uh, not allow us to be able to go ahead and blink. And what happens then, of course, it can lead, with untreated, it can lead to, to blindness. Uh, but because of that uh, very issue of the inability to blink, I have come up with what I call uh, 
the eye of exclusion. Can you go to the next one? Um, I'm trying to keep a tap on my time because I only have 15 minutes. The only ones that I want to be able to, to refer to, and this is something that I've been working on for decades and decades. Um, when you look at the concentric circles, everything starts out with the general system and it goes to the individual. Well, when it comes to an exclusion, it starts on what I think is on the right-hand side, the median. Uh, and then as, as that is put in, the stereotypes and the terminology that is used will impact economics, housing, and the health of individuals that have the disease. Because even nowadays, when a person is diagnosed, uh, they're trying to, the, the protocol is to try to be inclusive in the community. But the thing is that you're also dealing with persons that have some biases that already come in and have a perception that the fact that you have the disease, you're an inferior individual. The next slide, please. This is an aerial photo of the, what was known as the United States Public Health Service Hospital when I arrived there. Uh, you see right in the middle is the, the infirmary and then the connection, everything is interconnected by uh, walkways, uh, which is really phenomenal because this happened right before, I mean, way many, many, many decades before the American Disabilities Act where we were able to move around in bicycles or, or hand mobile uh, uh, wheelchairs. My house where I was at uh, is the one that is on the upper type. And on the left-hand side, there's a um, uh, uh, house. I, I lived on the first floor. It's an individual room and with uh, the communal bath. And it was with older people. When I arrived, I was the, the youngest individual there. Everybody else was the age of my parents in the 50s and 60s. So they had been there for many, many years. But the thing is, I wasn't just diagnosed. I had gone through <clears throat> a period where I had gone to uh, folk healers, curanderos. I had gone to dermatologists in San Antonio. I'm originally from Laredo, Texas. I went to all the doctors in Laredo. And the way that I was diagnosed was when my parents took me to a curandero in Monterrey, Mexico, and as I walked in, the curandero looked at me and he said, I can't help you because you have a disease of the Bible. My parents had no idea what it was. I had been sick for many, many years on and off with fevers and uh, a lot of sores that uh, would last a lifetime, a long time. When, uh, when I was finally diagnosed, I was uh, put in a, in a, in a uh, isolated room at the local hospital. And then the, the next day I was put in a hearse and traveled 750 miles. The hearse because the ambulance people back then told my parents, this is what my parents told me, that um, ambulances are for the living, hearses are for the dead. I, uh, I went there with uh, my parents following a car. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, uh, went with me. She was uh, wonderful. The place was uh, phenomenal because it was full of researchers, but at the same time, there was a lot of unwritten rules, even within the, the, the hospital, the leprosorium. Too many rules. Uh, you, if you violated those unwritten rules, there were consequences. Um, when I got there, the jail was no, no longer functional, but uh, I was put in jail emotionally because I violated rules. One of the biggest rules that I violated was at the chapel that was uh, designated, that was available. It's on the right-hand side. You can barely see it. Um, all the staff would sit on the right-hand side, all the patients on the left-hand side. And the priest would use two chalices to give the, the host, to administer the host. Well, one day I was so tired of that separation I sat on the other side and then ended up receiving the hose from the, um, um, the, the chalice that was traditionally used for staff. And that kind of broke the, the mold, but I was given the silent treatment by not only the staff, but also by the patients for over three months. It was a very painful experience. Next slide. The, the, the leprosoriums throughout the world have always been uh, 
uh, in an island or at least a facsimile of an island. So that uh, in, in Carville, the Mississippi River kind of meanders around uh, and forms a, a, a little island that uh, there's only one road in and one road out. It was ideal when it was built um, because it isolated everyone. This particular slide that I'm showing is I call lessons in people service. And that is that whenever there's fear and ignorance, you know, on the, on the left-hand side of that, you lose your, your, your rights, you lose your dignity, you lose your respect. And the government or whoever operates the facility spends a lot of money. But then with the new discovery in education, you go then to the houses where you go back into the community and you have support systems. However, the fear and ignorance continues because the community is so afraid of that. And there's uh, information um, that was put out by WHO just in the last week that shows that there are still 130 laws uh, internationally that uh, basically discriminate about people, movement, using transportation, uh, getting married, and uh, being segregated even in prisons. So discrimination is really an institutional thing, but it is a costly endeavor. Next slide. Uh, this particular slide shows some of the, the major places that I have visited uh, that uh, show that uh, people were basically isolated. Uh, you know, I already mentioned Carville and of course Paul referenced uh, Penixi. But the thing is that I went to Japan and their 13th tennis sanitaria. Um, people were, were isolated uh, and for life. Pontias was up on the, the top of a large uh, uh, extinct volcano, and then they built a, a fence of, of um, stone all around that. Spinalonga is off of uh, Greece, and Spinalonga has a long history because even during uh, World War II, um, people were wanting to go ahead and at least have the Allies uh, be able to release them, and they would not do that. Uh, Robin Island uh, is a wonderful place that I've been to, it's wonderful now, but I'm sure that it was not before. But it, it originally, people know about it as uh, Nelson Mandela's uh, prison, in prison area. But the thing is that before that happened, it was an island for persons who were diagnosed with, uh, with Hansen's disease. Uh, next slide. There's a, a lot of uh, efforts that have been made to isolate individuals back in, in the 1900s, uh, the first legislative session in Texas, my home state, uh, they went ahead and actually appropriated money to build a leprosorium on Galveston Island. The thing is that it, it never happened because the, the community there objected to it. And as a result, the money was never sent over there. However, this legislation still exists. And I'm trying to get in touch with some elected officials so I can basically declare stigma as being dead in Texas symbolically. Next slide. This is a picture of Calapapa settlement uh, in, uh, on the island of Molokai. Uh, Father Damien, Saint Damien made that uh, place uh, very noticeable. So, the Carville is the only one in the continental U.S. Peniski was on, a, on an island, and then uh, Molokai is also on another island. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of Mr. Morimoto in Japan, where he was uh, showing me how uh, women were allowed to, to, who became pregnant while at the sanitarium, they were allowed to go to full term and right before giving birth, they would abort the child and put him in a container so that they would see what would happen if they became pregnant. So sterilization happened quite a bit because of the disease. They didn't want this to be quote unquote spread. Next. This is a list of the 10 commandments, but there's also the 10 commandments uh, of persons who have been uh, affected and who have experienced Hansen's disease. Uh, the ones that, that are there that stand out for me is 
not being able to enter a church, not being able to enter a public building, not being able to enter a, a, a journey on a public road. And I violate those uh, commandments uh, on a daily basis. And I am so proud of it. But if you go ahead and compare the Ten Commandments with the Ten Commandments of persons who have been affected by the disease, it's there. And this is one of the things that talks about labeling. As people grow up, children learn about uh, what it takes to, to be um, uh, uh, practicing stigma. Next slide. Uh, it's an international thing. This picture was taken in China. Uh, I'm there with Bernard Punikaya, who was from Kalapapa Settlement, or Mr. Shu from India, and Mr. Arigata, Ari, Ariata from uh, Ethiopia. So it's an international effort. Next. So, so what do we need to reverse uh, stigma? I believe that in order to go ahead and do that, go to the next one, is to have some stigma busting strategies. And some of these strategies include the following. It's not all inclusive. Uh, Paul, the next one. Uh, one is uh, the person first language. Call me by my name. I'm not a patient. I'm not a pal. Person affected by leprosy, the acronym. I'm a person who has experienced cancer disease, but in essence, I am uh, a father, a son, a grandfather, I'm an uncle. I have uh, respect and dignity. Oral histories are very important. The involvement of women because they have suffered so much uh, stigma, more so than men. The, the disease affects twice as many men as it does women. But women experience a lot more stigma. Education, like what we're doing today, and myths, attack the myths and the commitment to change. Next. And uh, this is actually, uh, this is an older slide. It's, I now call it the eye of inclusion instead of networking. So if you look again at media on the right hand side, how it all points out, it goes from the individual to the system. And it's a great effort to be able to do that. Next slide. The um, in 1948, uh, the uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Roosevelt uh, was uh, this person who's, who's really responsible for this article. Uh, we're all born free and equal in dignity and human rights. I love that declaration. Something else that happened is that uh, President Kennedy uh, amended uh, the, uh, the national, the federal drug and cosmetics uh, uh, act that had to do with the little um, uh, because there was so much scare about the little mite. This was happening in 1962. Well, in 1968, when I arrived at Carville, the little mite was being used uh, on an experimental basis. And I was one of the first ones to take it. And my God, it, uh, it prevented me from, from having all the, uh, many of the physical disabilities that uh, uh, my brothers and sisters have experienced. Next. The, the, not everything was bad. I mean, the, uh, the social worker and the medical director, Dr. Trotman, who uh, died uh, earlier this year, actually went to LSU, which is 20 miles, exactly 20 miles from, from Carville, and requested permission for me to be able to attend school and drive back and forth. I, I, I had to get a pass. And I was taking 400 milligrams of thalidomide at the time. At this also clofacimine, uh, you see my dark skin. And it was even darker when I was going to school. Those are my parents uh, who were able to see my journey. And the thing is that living in Louisiana in the 60s really was a horrible experience if your skin was black or dark. And I, uh, I encountered no, so many um, references to me by the L word, but also by the N word uh, because of my complexion. Next one. So the greatest fear, in my opinion, is the fear of the unknown. It starts out with the, the power of ignorance. So what is it that you need to know? You need to know that fingers do not fall off, noses do not fall off. You need to be able to go ahead and, and, and realize that it is not a communicable disease. It is something that can be cured. And those of us who have experienced cancer disease, 
or human beings, and we go by a name. So the next one. Gracias, and I hope you will see the uh, the Astros game tomorrow and uh, get him uh, going into the World Series. So thank you very much. Uh, I think I might have exceeded my presentation by a few minutes. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, wonderful firsthand perspective and very important messages. I especially liked on your strategies, the education piece where you said nothing is interesting unless you're interested. So, uh, you know, I would emphasize that the best way to combat stigma is to um, be interested in it and learn about the disease and learn about people with the disease. Um, next, we are very honored to have Dr. David Scollard, who's both a pathologist and an immunologist. He got his MD and PhD degrees from the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. Um, he spent 25 years at Carville, the National Hansen's Disease Program. Uh, 16 of those, he was a research investigator. Uh, he spent five years as uh, chief of the clinical branch, and finally, his last four years were director. Uh, he served as the editor of the International Journal of, Lepr Journal of Leprosy for six years, uh, and he edited and contributed two chapters to the International Textbook of Leprosy. Um, so he's literally written the book on uh, this disease. And fortunately for us in Massachusetts, he has retired to Massachusetts. So there's a monthly clinic uh, at the Leahy Clinic that he's been attending. Um, and I will turn things over to Dr. Scollard and I will bring up his PowerPoint um, as soon as I can get it on the screen. There we go. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you also to Jose. I, I uh, echo Paul's comments. That was, in addition to being an extraordinary firsthand account, and uh, we can get that back, the, uh, the point is that this was a disease that was prevalent in Europe throughout the Middle Ages, along with many other diseases. Um, in the, uh, <clears throat> it receded from Europe, um, and the last part of Europe to have a large number of patients was actually Scandinavia. In the, six, in the 17 and 1800s, uh, doctors were trying to provide natural explanations for this uh, disease, and uh, the experts doing that were in Norway. So if you go to the next slide, please. The supreme experts in the, in the mid 1800s were in, um, in Norway, two dermatologists named Danielson and Beck. And they published an atlas in 1847, which uh, we, we can see that. The atlas um, differentiated what is and what is not leprosy. Uh, it was a, a, an atlas of uh, <clears throat> colored illustrations. And um, I have, um, just go to the next slide, please. Uh, this shows two pages from that atlas uh, superimposed side by side. Um, the uh, outstanding intellectual accomplishment of this atlas was to recognize that these two people had the same disease. The gentleman on the left, they called, they described his condition as nodular. And the young lady on the right, they described her condition as neural or macular. Macule is a dermatologic word for a flat patch. Um, this mark, I believe this atlas in 1847 marks the beginning of the modern medical understanding of this disease. Um, uh, it, it, uh, there were many illustrations in the book, of course, and I've just chosen these two. They didn't know what the cause was, however. This was 1847, and they didn't know the cause but they saw it clustering in families, so they speculated that it was hereditary, a disease that, as Jose has already alluded to, is still commonly held by many people. That was, that was wrong, that was not true. If we could go on to the next slide, please. The next uh, person on the scene, uh, scientifically, was a, a young Norwegian doctor named Armour Hansen. And Hansen had uh, actually married Danielson's daughter. In the mid 1800s, he was a, a medical student and in, of course, in university, you learn the radical new theories of the day. And the radical new theory of his day was the germ theory. Um, it was beginning to be understood in the, in the mid 1800s that germs cause diseases in, in some animals. 
it was not considered, however, that they caused diseases in people. Hansen, however, was at finishing medical school, was put in charge of a very large leprosarium in Bergen, Norway. Uh, no back, please. He was put in, a very, in charge of a very large leprosarium in Bergen, Norway. And there he used the microscope. You can see the photo of him at the top with a simple microscope with a mirror for illumination. He looked into it and had only simple staining devices. He saw what you see here in black and white, the, the, these rod shaped structures. Um, he, call, he said, I think these are germs and I think they cause this disease. And the medical community at the time said, we think he's nuts because germs don't cause diseases in people. However, at the same time, uh, or a few years later, Robert Koch down in, at the Pasteur Institute in Paris was able to isolate the germ that caused tuberculosis. He could culture that germ in a dish and he could, he could uh, repeat the, the disease in some animal models. And so people began to believe that germs could cause diseases in people and maybe Hansen was right. Next slide, please. While this was going on, uh, scientists in Germany were experimenting with different dyes to stain uh, tissue structures and bacteria. And they came across a particular technique in which they would stain bacteria with a red dye called fuchsin, and everything would stain red. And then they would dip it in an acid alcohol solution, and it would wash out of most bacteria, but not M. tuberculosis. So they, they said it was acid fast. They took their technique up to, up to Hansen in Norway and tried it out. And by golly, his bacilli were acid fast too. And this is what they look like under the microscope when we stain them today. We go to the next slide, please. So there was becoming a, a general acceptance that this disease was caused by a germ. And it was one germ. It always stained the same way. But it was a great puzzle. How could you have all these different appearances? I've, I've shown some here on the slide. One germ causing all these different uh, appearances or diseases. It, it, people were very puzzled by this and it was an, enig an enigma for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. So just in reviewing what happened in the 1800s, Danielson and Buck pub Beck published their atlas. Hansen described the bacilli. I hadn't mentioned that there was a recognition already that M. leprae in involved nerves and caused nerve injury that caused disability, it, which was a main theme throughout the, the rest of our understanding of this disease. There was gradual acceptance of bacilli as a cause. And then we come to what has uh, uh, already been discussed so eloquently by Jose, the global public health response. It's important to understand they had, they understood it was caused by a germ and it was contagious, but they had no cure. And so they, they opted to try to protect the public by quarantining people. Now quarantine is a, is a very valuable tool, although often despised tool in public health. If you have a ship when some people have cholera or typhoid, you keep the ship at, in the ocean for 40 days because if people are gonna get the disease, they're gonna get it in that time and get over it or, or die from it. And you'll know, you can then bring the ship to harbor and people are safe. With leprosy, they didn't know when it actually started and they didn't know when it ended. So the impact was that when they quarantined people, they were quarantining them for life. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next slide. So that was the situation then with uh, when Penikes Island began in 1905. They knew it was caused by a germ. They could see it, but they couldn't culture it. They were understanding that it affected nerves and that patients had disabilities as a result. And uh, uh, so Jose has already described the disabilities of the eyes very well. There was no cure and so they were to protect the public by quarantine. Next slide, please. Now, this is my illustration of the, uh, it's a photograph of the first flag raising at Carville in 1921, uh, picking up on the theme that Jose discussed about all these different leprosaria. In fact, around the world from the 1890s into the 1920s, uh, these hospitals were established everywhere because everybody accepted this idea as a solution. It was a bad idea, but they accepted it as a solution. Uh, next slide, please. And so in the United States, we had Penningese Island established in 1905. Halapapa in Hawaii was established in 1910, and that became the famous site of the work by Father Damien. Uh, the National Leprosarium was established at Carville uh, in Louisiana in 1921, and what it had been functioning as a state facility for some years before that. 
So next slide, please. Um, things, they, they had no treatment. And so the next, the next advance in our knowledge was uh, a, a major study done, done by Dr. Duell, James Duell from Johns Hopkins, working with a number of uh, very talented uh, Filipino physicians in the 1930s. They, they observed a patient move, uh, a man who didn't, wasn't known to have the disease, a fisherman moved from one island to another. And then he developed the infection. He'd obviously been infected. They didn't have any treatment, but they carefully followed what happened on that island and how it played out in the island, how it was transmitted to other people. It's the best and perhaps only really good study of the natural history of this disease before treatment, uh, before the time of treatment. Two important observations came from this study. The first is that about only one in 20 of, the, of people were susceptible. 95% of people are naturally immune. That means if there are 100 people watching now, five people might be susceptible and 95% wouldn't get it even no matter how heavily they're exposed. This is a very important point with this disease. The other thing they realized, observed, is that the incubation time is very long. It's measured in years sometimes even 10 years or more, which is far longer than other diseases we think about as infectious, like you know, measles and mumps and COVID. You know, the, in, infection, the incubation time is days or, or weeks. Tuberculosis, several weeks. This is years. These two things together explain why this disease was so frightening to people, um, because it seemed to appear at random, just someone would be selected and other people weren't. And then you couldn't connect who got it one time from who got it 10 years later. So this was part of the understanding that helps us understand um, this disease and why it was so misunderstood in the past. Um, next slide, please. So during these years, there was still a great effort to try to find drugs that would work, but they, they couldn't study them in cultures and in animals like in tuberculosis. What they did was take drugs that had been developed for tuberculosis and try them uh, in leprosy. And they tried several, several different times. Uh, some of the people that uh, Jose Medicarville were undoubtedly part of these trials in the earlier years. Finally, in 1941, Dr. Guy Tuget, shown here was the chief clinician at Carville, he tried a drug called Promine, an injectable sulfone drug that had been developed for, for tuberculosis but didn't really work very well clinically. They tried it in the patients at Hansen's at Carville and it worked. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you how it worked. I have a series of photographs here of one woman. This is a photograph of her before treatment. If you go to the next, please. This is after a few years and the next, another few years and one more. Over seven years, you could see this disease recede. And as the medical note described, she got her face back. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so by, by 19... Uh, so in, in the 1900s, we had the, the institutions established. We learned something very basic, important things about the epidemiology of the disease. And in the 1940s, it became curable. This is the watershed moment for leprosy because now people could be cured. And uh, what happened then, especially starting, it took until the end of the war and, and international shipping connections to be reestablished. But right around 1950, Dapsone was distributed around the world to all the continents. It was fortunately quite inexpensive, um, quite safe, and, um, and quite effective. But it worked very slowly and patients were told they had to take it for life. That's what they were told at the time. Next slide, please. Things picked up rapidly in the 1960s. First of all, Charles Shepard, uh, working at the CDC, uh, was able to grow M. lepre in the foot pads of mice. People had observed that a, a leprosy lesions often occurred in the cool parts of the body. He took that idea and tried the foot pad of the mouse, which is a cool place in the mouse. And in fact, he was able to see growth. The photo here is not from a normal mouse. It's a, an immunodeficient mouse in which you can more readily appreciate the swelling. But this was a valuable new tool because now new drugs could be tested for this disease in mice before human trials. And you could weed out the ones that didn't work and it initiated a flurry of efforts to, to test uh, several new drugs and discover some that would work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, yes, and, and we still had this enigma. One germ 
why so many different appearances? That was under, answered, uh, next slide please, um, by Dr. Olaf Skinsness, uh, another a Norwegian American physician, continuing the Norwegian theme. Um, he was a pathologist who observed, and I wanna take a little technical moment here. If you look at the picture on the upper left, uh, Mark TT, this is a picture of the histology of the skin and the disease. And if you notice in kind of the mid left uh, side of that picture, there's kind of a round structure. You see it again in the lower part of the next photo to the right, the BT photo. This is called a granuloma and it's characteristic of high resistance. It's seen routinely and characteristically in tuberculosis. Um, he observed this in these patients and then he observed that, in, if you look at the pic pictures at the bottom, bacilli in these patients were very scarce, hard to find. If you, if you look carefully, you might see a couple of red dots in those photos. They're rare and difficult to find. Then he observed at the opposite pole, there were people as, as shown at the right with the nodular lesions um, in, in the picture above, you see the infiltrate in the skin is very disorganized. And at the bottom, it's filled, filled with just enormous numbers of bacilli. He said, I think the reason for all these differences is differences in the patient's ability to make a cellular immune response to this organism. Uh, and you see the different clinical uh, photos across the center here. Uh, two years later, next slide please, Doctors Ridley and Jopling, two English physicians, uh, published a paper showing a classification of this disease, a uh, next please, uh, based on immunity. And what you see is that as cellular immunity declines across this uh, spectrum, um, the number of bacteria increases. So people at the left hand pole, oh, one more click please, people at the left hand pole have uh, a rare bacilli and they have these macules. This is what uh, Danielson and Beck were seeing a hundred years before. Um, and on the right hand side, you see the nodular lesion. This patient has many bacilli, but it's a graded series of, of uh, degrees of immunity across the spectrum. This accomplished two major things. First, it pr provided a means for doctors to communicate about all these different appearances in a systematic way. So publications, communications with doctors in letters and on the phone, could, could use a, a single uh, way to talk about this disease. Secondly, it, it inspired a furious, a new uh, round of immunology research to try to understand how the spectrum works. That research still continues very actively. Uh, we know a lot about the immunology of this disease, but we still can't give you a simple, single explanation about how uh, all these different, uh, the immune system can react in all these different ways to, to a single germ. That's something that's still being worked on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I've, I've already talked about these two, and I wanna point out then that during the 1950s and 60s, there was increasing outpatient treatment of leprosy because now you could cure it. Uh, they first used the injectable drug, but then they developed uh, an oral uh, drug called Dapsone which could be readily used everywhere. Um, and next click, please. Um, the, the next thing that happened in the 1970s was the recognition that the armadillo could be an experimental model. Armadillos also have a low body temperature. And so people at Carville inoculated them. And to their amazement, they got the disease. Uh, however, uh, after further study, a few years later, it was realized that the disease had always been present in some armadillos in the wild but nobody had been looking, so nobody saw it before. Uh, next slide, please. So now there was an armadillo, next, next click, please. Now there was an armadillo model. Now we have an, an intact, immunologically intact animal, the armadillo. We also had the mouse. That was in the 70s. This gave uh, further impetus to leprosy research. In 1981, enough, enough new uh, drugs had been developed and tested that the World Health Organization recommended something called multiple drug treatment, uh, a three drug therapy and the blister pack they distributed around the world is shown in the lower left corner here. The white pills are Dapsone, the cell phone drug that we still use today. These blister packs are still used today. The big uh, long pills at the top are rifampicin, which is given once a month. And then the little black pills each day are clofazamine, the drug that uh, Jose took that also turns the skin dark. Together, this, this potent cocktail 
works extremely well. People don't have to take it, uh, the medicine for life. They do have to take it for a year, sometimes two. So it's still a long treatment, but it works well. It really works well. It cures the infection. In the 1990s, we were able to show at Cardinal that the armadillo was actually a very good model for nerve injury in this disease. So now one can study the mechanisms that are responsible for the nerve injury that's responsible for the disabilities, which bring about most of the stigma and the fear in this disease. And finally, at the bottom of the slide, I've indicated that in the year 2000, after 20 years of using MDT, the World Health Assembly declared leprosy eliminated as a public health problem. This is a little deceptive. They took the entire number of patients known in the world in 2000, they divided by the total population of the world in 2000, and said that that number was small enough that it was no longer a public health problem. It's deceptive because there are still many countries in the world that have a real problem with this disease, and in some countries it's actually still increasing. Uh, next slide, please. So what was happening also in the 90s, no, no, back please, one back. Uh, what was happening in the 90s also was a much greater facility in studying and purifying and amplifying DNA. And so as we turn to the present century, uh, the first couple of decades anyway, genomics takes over our, our role in understanding this disease. First of all, in 2001, Stuart Cole, a Welsh physician working at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, was able to publish the genome, the entire DNA sequence of the M. leprae genome. So we still can't culture it, but now uh, we can look at the DNA. And the first thing they observed was that some genes for some enzymes for key metabolic pathways are missing. That's why it won't grow. It can only grow inside a host cell, like a macrophage or a nerve cell, where it gets help from the, its host cell. Um, Hansen, now there's an answer to why Hansen couldn't culture his bacilli. In 2003, the sequence of the human genome was, was published. And a year later in 2004, Marcelo Mira, a Brazilian graduate student working at McGill University in Montreal, found a single gene associated with overall susceptibility or resistance to leprosy. Um, there are now three other disease uh, genes in this category that determine whether you do or don't get the infection at all. And if you inherit the right genes, you'll be resistant and you won't get the disease. Uh, right now, the active, <laughs> thank you. So the, the, the last thing that happened then was the armadillo genome was sequenced in, in 2011. And in the same year, genotyping studies of M. leprae showed that this disease, this bacillus is a zoonosis in armadillos in the Gulf Coast of the United States. A zoonosis means it's present in the wild animal population as a native infection, um, and it can be transmitted to people. Uh, that paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which will resonate with some folks here in Massachusetts. It's very rare that uh, leprosy makes it into the New England Journal of Medicine. Finally, I would note that what's happening today, an exciting development is studies trying to see if we can give a prophylactic dose of medicine to people after they've been exposed, like in a household, but before the disease has developed, to see if that can be used to further reduce the number of patients in the world. Um, we can skip over the next couple of slides quickly, if you will. I've, I've used up my time. Uh, one more, one more, and one more. My last slide. I do want to emphasize that this disease is curable. A wonderful shirt was uh, some of the folks had at a International Leprosy Congress in 2004. The front of the shirt said, got leprosy, and on the back it said, how to cure it, MDT, given freely available, um, sent out by the World Health Organization, and this treatment is available freely in all countries of the world. I know I've also gone over my time, but I thank you for your attention. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, I appreciate that very much, uh, and I'm sure other people do as well, and we'll have lots of uh, follow-up questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, our last speaker, our last panelist today, um, is journalist Ken Hartnett, who I mentioned back in 1994, uh, produced a documentary. It was aired on uh, WGBH out of Boston um, called The Lepers of Buzzards Bay. It was co-produced with Lisa Schmidt. Uh, 
It was narrated by Doris Kearns Goodwin, a, a younger Doris Kearns Goodwin. Um, and uh, um, as I'm sure you will discover, um, there's some unanswered questions that um, I think it's fair to say have, have plagued Ken ever since. I've had the pleasure of talking to him over the years and uh, he, he never forgets these things. Um, his more recent project I'll mention is founding a newspaper. Um, he is based in New Bedford and uh, as a journalist, he and another of his, some other colleagues weren't uh, all that pleased with the local newspaper coverage. So they decided they would create their own. Um, so uh, the New, New Bedford Light is a free nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news outlet dedicated to community-based coverage of important local issues. Um, as he will tell you, um, and as we have seen over the last year and a half to two years, um, politics and science don't always mix particularly well. So with that brief introduction, I will turn things over to Ken. Yeah, good evening, everybody. My hope is that a hundred years from now, we learn so much more about medicine and culture and societal attitudes that we never repeat the mistakes that led to the creation and continuation of the Pedicke's Hospital for so many years. I don't think we can be sure of that after we see for ourselves how the public health can get politicized, science question and fear and ignorance can distort reality as we did in our current pandemic. That's why I think it's so important to study pedicles. As Jose pointed out so eloquently, fear and ignorance drove so much of, of, of the problem. And it was embedded by the political side and the economic side and, and uh, anyway, it was a different time a hundred years ago, obviously. The 20th century had just dawned. We were brimming with optimism. We had new possessions in the Pacific and the Caribbean, stunning breakthroughs, as the doctor pointed out, in medicine, industrialization, technology, the automobile and the aircraft industry were in their infancy. We were flexing our military muscle. It was, most Americans felt really, morning in America. Immigration was swelling our population to meet the needs of the factories and mills, as in New Bedford, for example, and raising the anxiety levels of Americans who feared that people ethnically and culturally different might change the way things were with their different customs, beliefs, languages, and colors. Somehow, though, near the end of the 19th century, leprosy became a major topic of societal concern. Not that there were that many cases confirmed for leprosy in the United States or in Massachusetts, but the fear was that there might be, given the number of cases in our new possessions in the Pacific, specifically the Philippines and Hawaii. The horror of the disease was growing at the same time. Scientists were following the lead of Dr. Hansen in pinpointing the cause, not as an airborne miasmic pathogen or God-driven punishment to sinners, but it was bacillus not especially contagious. Nevertheless, the horror cultivated over the millennia persisted in this puritan tainted culture of Massachusetts, where Cotton Mather once was described the disease as the whip of God for the sins of man. After a few cases of leprosy were discovered in Massachusetts, the fear began infecting politics and even medicine. A man named Frank Pena, a Cape Verdean immigrant, lived with his wife and children in Harwich on Cape Cod. And soon the politicians got involved when he was, when he was diagnosed with the disease. 
state officials wanted him sent to the Tex Tewksbury Hospital, but the hospital officials in Tewksbury wouldn't have him. He was temporarily kept in a shack about several hundred yards from his house. His wife brought him his meals. The arrangement couldn't last forever. State officials said, let's put a leprosy hospital on Cape Cod, maybe in, near Harwich. That led an in outpouring of Cape people to the state house in protest. They filled a car, a special car train, flooded the state house. The politicians said they'd have to find an uninhabited place where, where people afflicted with the disease could be treated. An island would be perfect. An uninhabited island would be even better. But where were they going to find such a place? Well, it happened that the man from New Bedford happened to own <laughs> Penikees Island, and he sold it to the state for $25,000, and soon the Leprosy Act was passed so that anyone diagnosed in Massachusetts with the disease would have to be sent and quarantined till he was cured or she was cured. And that might take, well, that would never happen, would it? So it, they were sentenced, basically, they were sentenced to life. And, and they were separated in, a, in the coolest possible way. Well, for example, let's talk about Supremia again. He was whisked away from his family without warning out of the shack with the first batch of lepers. Now we talked, Lisa and I talked to the grandson, Rufus Pena, 70 years later. The man was still distressed, not only at the way he lost his grandfather, but the old effect it had on his family. He talked about how his aunts and uncles were reluctant to marry because of the stigma attached and the fear that infested them uh, as, as much as anything, that they might themselves get the disease. So they were afraid to bring children into the world. They were afraid to enter into relationships. Can you imagine the distortion? And Frank, uh, and Rufus Pena, when he was, uh, he was going to school at the time, it was an integrated school, but he and all the Cape Verdean, all the Cape Verdean children on that, in that town were plucked out of that school and sent to another school where they would be alone in that place. But they, they, had, they were not provided a bus to go there. So they had to walk the two or three miles that it was to get to the school. And can you imagine how that must have felt to those children? It was just unbelievable. And the, meanwhile, in the family setting, in the family setting, they were reluctant to even discuss the name Frank Pena. It was never mentioned. The grandfather had just evaporated. And they, he was talking about this, and he was so emotional about this. It was one of the striking parts of, of our documentary. Just the fact that this rage and sorrow and distress and contempt, the, the, the contempt that people felt for him because of the color of his skin, because he was a Cape Verdean, was just, you know, it was intolerable. And this is just an example of what the heck was going on. And there was a boy in, in Upton, uh, Massachusetts, a suburban boy, Archie. And Archie <laughs> was diagnosed in the high school. He was at Upton High School. He played the organ. He played the organ in church. And Archie was diagnosed, sent to Pedicis. But when Archie left the town with the diagnosis, they burned his desk where he sat in the school. They, they destroyed the organ 
that he pumped, that he, that he basically just he provided the power for the organ. And they just, they, just, they just assembled that organ. And Archie went off, his mother came with him at her own insistence. And that became the, ta the, the stuff of tabloids, of course. But it was, it was, uh, uh, it was just an incredible kind of atrocity. And now it was a, an atrocity that was so well intentioned. Nobody wanted, nobody wanted to really uh, be that cruel, but they were so afraid. They were so afraid and, and they disregarded the science. The doctors in New York, the doctors, even the doctors here, you know, knew, but most of them knew, or I should say a good percentage of them knew that the, the disease was not as easily transmitted. They certainly did that. That's why some of the doctors may have volunteered to go out on the island. But even the doctors had a reluctance because their association with, with the, with the uh, victims of this disease tainted them. Dr. Parker was this wonderful man who stayed on this island after he, he succeeded in incompetent as the first superintendent, he became the second superintendent and stayed through the end of it. But Dr. Parker, when he left, the, when he left, he couldn't get a patient. He couldn't get hired by a practice. He couldn't get into a hospital. He was known as a leper doctor. And so he went out to, to Montana, would live with his son out in Montana. And he died fighting a, 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 a whooping cough epidemic out there. But, but uh, Parker was just one of the victims of it. There was, a, there was so much struggle between the doctors like Parker, who treated the patients, and the other doctors that were out there that fought the disease. They were very well motivated. They came from Harvard. And they were very serious about finding a cure for the disease. And there was a competition to try to find that cure through all sorts of crazy kind of, often very crazy ways of doing it. But uh, Dr. Parker, had, at a certain point, there was a cluster of deaths. Maybe there were maybe two or three deaths in the first four or five years. And then over the next five years, we eight. And maybe there was a natural progression, but some of the people we talked to said it was more likely a result of the kind of experiments. They were, they were farming lymph nodes. They were, I don't know what that involves. I, I, Dr. Uh, Scholar can tell us, but, but it's, uh, it resulted in a, in a split between Harvard and Dr. Parker, who refused to let Harvard students come back on the island. And it also caused a problem with money because of the political influence of, of uh, Harvard University on the state legislature. So the money was caught. And when Harvard, uh, when, when uh, Parker went down to Washington because there was state agitation for the creation of a of, a, of the Carville as a national hospital, Parker went down there and was very unenthusiastic about closing Pennekees Island because he was afraid that the people would be exposed to a totally different environment and more experimentation, and he didn't. And the hospital wasn't quite ready anyway. At that time, it was kind of primitive, from what I understand. So anyway, they when he left the the uh, 
when the when the, when the um, Penakees Island was shut down and Parker was cut loose and they 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 put all the patients maybe you should have called them inmates because I think they were treated more as as uh, inmates than as patients sometimes they were so they were put into uh, railroad cars that were sealed so nobody could get in or out and they were made the trip to a place that they'd never seen before where they knew no one where they were even farther isolated from their families which they never saw anyway it was it's a terrible thing and the compassion for those who who were subject to that no more than maybe 50 people over over those years there's a very short supply outside of people you know some of the folks like uh, uh, Dr. Strong from Harvard uh, tropical disease and he was in the new doctors in New York State who mocked the the, the, the creation of Penakees Island uh, it was really little recognition and sympathy, empathy for what the folks were going through and what they had gone through. So it's, uh, I'm, I think people have to keep in mind how, again, that same sense of fear of this, uh, that may be built into people. I don't know. It's just built in or how it comes. I don't know where, it, but it, it's, it's, it causes just a turning off of, of not only the mind, it, turn, it turns off of so much else. And, it, and it's, uh, it's, let's hope it is a result of the peculiar conditions. Let's hope it's Bible based, but it's just, uh, you, you wonder whether it could ever be repeated again. And, and we see, as we see science so discounted and false information so accepted, you have to look with a little bit of trepidation towards what happens next with the next disease that causes public fear. Anyway, thank you. That's all I have to say. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. And I think you're absolutely right to point out that this is. This is by no means the only disease that has caused um, fear as a reaction. Um, so I just briefly want to thank all three panelists very much for their time and perspectives and, and expertise. We, um, uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. There are a few, a few quick threads I wanted to pick up on uh, about Penike specifically. Um, Dr. Parker and his wife, Marion, were actually the second superintendents on the island. The first superintendent, I believe, was uh, Lewis Edmonds, who had treated um, one of the first five patients, perhaps Frank Pina. Um, uh, he could not take life on the island. It was very lonely. It's a small island, 74 acres. It it's, was barren by that point. All the trees had been cut down. Um, and so Frank Parker and his wife were the, the second superintendent. Um, and they were instrumental in making the, the hospital a home, really, um, and a small community. And, it, and to Ken's point, it was actually much less than 50 patients. Over the 16 years the hospital was operational, it was 36 patients. And they came from all over the globe. I'm looking at the um, list of patients, Cape Verde, China, uh, British West Indies, Russia, uh, Japan, Syria, uh, the Azores, uh, and not everybody spoke English. So it was a very difficult um, situation. Greece, Turkey, Cuba. Um, and, and each of these patients has a story. I, I think a lot of um, what's written about Penikes focuses primarily on Dr. Parker and his wife and for good reason. Um, but but the, the patient stories are really quite remarkable. And Frank Pina, one of the first patients, um, from Harwich was one, had eight children, uh, and the family still lives in the area. And I'm hoping if we have time, I spoke with uh, 
um, a, a school teacher who is taught, she is now teaching the third descendant of Frank Pena. Uh, and I know a number of people on the panel have other connections. They've either written books or they've done research on the island itself. Uh, I wanna put in a quick plug for the Mass Audubon Society. The island now uh, is essentially left to the birds, um, quite literally. And the Audubon Society does a wonderful tour of Panakis and nearby Cuddyhunk Island. I, I took the tour a couple weeks ago and uh, they tell the history of the island. And while you're standing there on the island, it's really pretty remarkable. Well, um, I, I bring up a something like a neglect, like which is very important, I think. The uh, Pedicke's Hospital was not administered by doctors. It was really governed by the Board of Public Charity. And I think that was a very deliberate uh, separation. It kept it in, the hospital kept under political control and the power of the purse was in the hands of the, the, the people who were dispensing charity. Anyway. Um, a, a couple of quick questions from the chat and then I will open things up. Um, there was a question about um, the, the Leahy Clinic, which is where there are monthly um, clinics now and who, who ran that previously. Um, Dr. Sam Michella, who's a dermatologist that Dr. Scholard and I had the, the honor of speaking with on Zoom just recently, and our interview is going to be part of the virtual component of this exhibit, along with a number of other uh, interviews. Um, so Panicky's closed in March of 1921. Sam Michella was born in April 1921. Um, and um, we're very fortunate again to have him in the area. And so I wish we had more time to talk about his work as well. Um, the display uh, at the Public Health Museum, I, I, this discussion makes me think of lots more resources uh, and things that we have that we could include. But I'm, I'm going to be quiet and um, uh, let other people speak. Um, so are we able to unmute people? <clears throat> are people to, able to ask their own questions? Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Ashlyn was uh, computer crashed or something happened. So she she had that control. So I think we have to go through the chat. And so people right. should put their questions in the chat. Paul will read the questions and present them to the speakers. All right. I, um, I agree. Alan uh, Steinbach has made a number of very good questions. Um, and I had the same question uh, for Dr. Scholard, which is what, what's the evidence that uh, doctors understood that quarantine was not necessarily even in 1905? You mentioned that somewhat in passing and, and feel free to respond to that. Yes, uh, so even in his later years, uh, Hansen began to feel that it might not be as highly contagious as was considered. He had access to the remarkable data that collected by the uh, Department of Health in Norway, uh, data that's so well done that epidemiologists still use it sometimes for baseline work. Um, and he could see that it wasn't as highly contagious as advertised. Um, so that idea was growing and he was communicating. I've, I've seen correspondence uh, he had with physicians in the United States about this in the, in the 20s. So this was the idea, but you know, um, it was hard. It was hard to prove. Uh, people, um, they didn't have enough data until later to show how how uh, how difficult it was to transmit this disease. Um, and so, it basically was uh, a, a matter that had it was controversial within within the medical community about how really how uh, contagious it was. So that's the first thing. Medical authorities didn't all agree. But the second, and probably the, the enduring thing, is that society didn't share that idea. Even today, what we're doing right now in education is to try to explain this message. Uh, and there are people who hear it and don't believe it. There are people who hear me say this disease is curable and they won't believe it. So, um, and, and most of the time, people aren't even thinking about this disease until someone in there school or their church or someone they know gets it and all they go back on is what they learned in Sunday school or what they read in a book or a movie 
Um, so there's, we have good knowledge today, but it's still not nearly as widely uh, disseminated in society as we need. And so to the, the, the uh, remarks that Jose made and also Ken, with these just uh, gut-wrenching stories about people's personal lives um, is due to fear and the fear is due to ignorance. And all we can do is keep trying to, uh, to teach what we know to be the, the fact. And a, and a quick follow-up, you think about how, how little contagious leprosy is in comparison to so many other diseases that we don't quarantine for, tuberculosis, and, and smallpox. And the, um, the, the reason why this disease is so frightening, I alluded to some, some reasons. The bottom line is that it affects nerves and, and um, Jose described very well how it can affect the eye. You lose sensation, if, if it affects the nerves of the face, you can lose sensation of the cornea. If you or I get something in our eye, we immediately stop because it hurts. If you can't feel it, it just stays there. And then if, the, if you can't close the eye completely, the cornea dries out. Together, the scratching and the drying make it, it heals by scarring and that eye is blind. Uh, this can happen in both eyes. You can similarly develop uh, lesions in, in hands and feet related to, to nerve injury, which is the key thing in this disease. All of these things are very frightening and they're, uh, they're hard for people who don't wanna really pay close attention to understand. It's easier just to be afraid of it and say, go away. I mean, and that unfortunately is what, what happened. Um, Naren, can you hear me? I think you're unmuted. Yes, um, I can hear you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, 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 we, have, we actually had an exhibit on Hansen's disease 15 years ago, which we hadn't realized at the time was sort of the centennial of the opening of Penikis. Uh, and Naren Chirmale spoke uh, about his early graduate work working on a vaccine for leprosy. So I, I see you raised your hand. There was a question about vaccines. I don't know if you want to jump in with a couple words on that front. Well, I, I can definitely speak about the vaccine and maybe depending on time, but I really had a question for Jose, if it's okay. Sure. Uh, Jose, first of all, thank you for sharing your um, experiences. It was extremely touching to hear the kind of things that you experienced so openly. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, I did my PhD in India on, on working on the leprosy vaccine in, in the early 80s. And I used to go to what was what in Mumbai is called Ackworth Leprosy Hospital. Uh, and um, I used to go literally every day to those hospitals. And um, there's a lot of stigma, as you mentioned, uh, and I used to see those patients as you, you know, collect blood for the immunology work that I was doing. And I was there for, I used to go almost every day for five years. And those, those people became my friends, but they were, I could also see that they were, you know, like in jail. Uh, they were not allowed to leave the campus. They, were, they had all these rules. So my question to you was, is, is you know, when you, when you first were diagnosed in 20, at, at the age of 20, of course, time was very different. Um, you know, what, 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 what was going on in your mind and sort of fast forward, maybe whatever, 50 years later, if someone gets infected, a younger person gets infected now with leprosy, what should they be thinking? And like as a patient? Well, when I was diagnosed, uh, my parents and everybody else who knew about the disease thought that I was going to die. And I was, as I was leaving the hospital to be taken to the first, uh, there was a priest following me to give the last rites. Uh, so I, you know, was put in a hearse and, and the journey was as if I was already going to my grave. Um, at that particular time, though, there was uh, also a, a practice by the public health department of Texas that said that if you were ever diagnosed with disease, you needed to be under treatment. So as a result, I had to be sent to, to Carville. I could not stay in Texas. Uh, Carville, the leprosarium was considered having a voluntary admissions, but you could not leave uh, voluntarily. Now, the WHO has come up with some new information that there can be as many as a thousand existing colonies, many in India, where, you know, because of the, the politics and the regionalization of those governments where they have a lot of power, they still mandate that persons are isolated. 
in Brazil, for example, and actually in every other uh, leprosorium or colony or sanitary, as they were called, uh, did not allow for children to be there. So if somebody became pregnant like they did in Japan, they would abort. But in Brazil, they would allow you to have the child, but then it would be taken away. So mm. those children have grown up. So what happens today is that uh, with Dr. Scholard and others that are operating the clinics, they're in a position to be able to provide that education that is needed. What is grossly lacking in each of those clinics throughout the United States and even in other clinics throughout the world is the presence of a social worker who can deal with the trauma and the grief that comes with a new diagnosis. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I'll, be, I'll go offline. Um, so a couple quick uh, additional references that are, that are part of the exhibit um, that I would like to mention are, uh, first of all, a, a book of poetry that was written by Eve Rifka um, called Outcast. And it's, a, it's an entire book of poems written from the patient's perspective. And, and it is truly wonderful and humanizing. Uh, and I highly recommend that. I think the, it's um, Little Pear Press is the publisher and I believe they've gone out of business. So you'll need to contact Eve directly uh, if you're interested in purchasing a book. Um, uh, I, I think she was on the panel. I don't see her now, uh, but it's Eve Rifka, R-I-F-K-A-H. There's also an award-winning young adult book called Beyond the Bright Sea by Lauren Wolk, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. Um, but it um, not only is it a wonderful young adult book set with Penikes as the backdrop, uh, historical fiction, it, it uh, I believe won the Scott O'Dell Award for historical fiction. Um, but uh, we have with us Sarah Cortez, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, who teaches this book to students and as part of reading this book, they actually go to Penikis. And so they discuss the book in on the island itself, which is a fantastic learning experience. Um, and uh, sort of the one of the earlier books that was written on Penikis is called uh, Penikis Island of Hope by Tom Buckley, um, who worked with the Penikis Island School, which was a later incarnation of the island. Um, so all three of those I highly recommend. Um, and I did want to address the first, uh, I think the one and only question in the Q&A, uh, since uh, Ian did take the time to write his question in the Q&A. And this is, I think, for any of the panelists to discuss parallels between leprosy and, for instance, COVID uh, that we see now. I know there was another question in the chat um, talking about are there lessons we can learn from leprosy to apply, uh, say, to COVID or other diseases. So I'll open that up to any of the panelists who want to comment on that. Jose? I, I can tell you that uh, there are many people throughout the world who know that they have the disease and they're not willing to go and get the medication because of fear that people have that they're going to be isolated, that they're going to be uh, stigmatized, that they're going to lose their job, that they're going to lose their family, that they're going to be in a position where they will not be able to have a future. So in that way, I believe that within COVID, there's this mindset of, of course, having my own freedom. But I believe that uh, some people are actually afraid to go ahead and acknowledge the fact that they might have COVID. And as a result, are reluctant to, to take the, uh, the vaccine. So those are the similarities that I have seen. Uh, there are probably others, but that's the one that is most pronounced for me. Um, and and I, we've had this conversation um, as well, I think, Jose, which is in the early 80s and 90s, when HIV came along, a, a lot of even patients with HIV we're drawing parallels to people with leprosy and saying, don't treat us as if we have leprosy, as if that was somehow a, a good thing to be saying. Well, it's the same thing that happened with cancer, uh, the C word. Uh, it, it, it seems like with every disease, you know, it's the same thing. And unfortunately, athletes who 
all of the the grace of uh, you know the uh, being seen as uh, heroes use the same thing you know you treat me as if i have uh, the disease um one of the comments in the chat is that the cape cod library system has uh, eve's book and also eve put in the chat uh, if you're interested in um, contacting her, uh, her website is everifka.com, E-V-E-R-I-F-K-A-H.com. Um, and the, her book of poems, Outcast, is $18, including shipping. Um, there was another question that I, oh, that I wanted to address, which is whether the, so the general question is how is the bacterium spread and in particular does it exist in the environment right if armadillos were discovered to have the disease it must have come from somewhere and i was actually sent a very recent article by a friend of mine and al sent me the same article talking about um, leprosy very recently discovered in chimpanzees i believe um, might have been gorillas, but I think it was chimpanzees. So I don't know, um, Dr. Scholard, if you want to comment on, on whether uh, the bacterium can survive in the wild or the, in the environment. There is no yet no good scientific evidence that this germ can survive in the environment outside of the cells of a host. It's been, it has, it has occurred in rhesus monkeys. Uh, now the chimpanzee has been reported uh, and, and now, of course, the armadillo. Um, th that doesn't mean that the disease is present somehow in the environment. It, it means that it's being shared between humans and these other species, at least that. Uh, whether there is an environmental source is still a, pretty much an open question. Uh, it's, for a whole bunch of technical reasons, it's extremely difficult to, to, uh, to prove this. People are still trying. There's a suspicion that it can be found in the soil or in the water. It might survive outside in a moist environment for a month or something. But it's really a very decrepit organism missing all these important genes. So it's just not likely to survive in the environment. What does happen uh, uh, about the armadillo, it's pr pretty obvious from all the data, which is too much to go into, that armadillos got it from people. There's no evidence of, of the disease in any form in the Western Hemisphere until after colonization and, and the importation of slaves and all of that. So uh, it's the best understanding now is that it, it came into Central America um, and uh, the disease did uh, with people. And some people like armadillos, they keep them as pets and whatever. And, and that probably armadillos got it from people. And that's, and then it's just continued. Um, that's a long story, but that's the short piece of it. There's so, also 20, 25 species of armadillos, and it's only the nine banded armadillo only that one. is found in, in South uh, Texas or uh, southern part of the U.S. Uh, I feel that uh, I uh, ended up with a disease when I ate armadillo when I was very young and I was out in the fields with my grandfather, also working the fields. I was a migrant worker, always with my hands. That's my suspicion. It's never been proven by uh, doctor, people like Dr. Scholard or others, but that's my belief. It's, it's quite, a, quite a likely possibility that that's what happened um, because we have still today about 25% of the patients in the United States who acquire this disease um, were born and raised in the United States and haven't traveled. They're getting it from somehow through through the armadillo, but exactly how it's going from armadillos to people, this issue of transmission is still uh, a great puzzle. We think it's airborne, but that's a very simple statement and the, the details are complex. I like to say that I have a huge extended family in the armadillos, so don't do any roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do want to acknowledge that, that we're five minutes over time. I'm more than happy to stick around. I, if the panelists are willing to stick around, um, we still have 74 people uh, who are listening in. So I, I'm happy to keep going uh, as long as other people are. Uh, I did take a two minute break, if you don't mind. Okay, thanks, Ken. I'll be right back. Um, so I do know that... Um,
Claire Maines is on the call and I just today got a copy of her book. Uh, sorry, maybe I can remove my background for one second so I can uh, show it to you. Um, and she has written a book uh, called Out of the Shadow of Leprosy, uh, The Carville Letters and the Stories of the Landry Family. I know there are um, other fascinating family stories um, uh, out of Carville. I also want to point out, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Pam Fessler's new book. Uh, NPR journalist Pam Fessler has written a book called Carville's Cure. Um, I believe it was her uncle who was a patient at Carville. Uh, and her book is actually the uh, Public Health Museum uh, book club choice for November. Um, so if you go to, uh, I hope it's on the website, uh, publichealthmuseum.org. Uh, if anybody wants to send me an email, I can send you a flyer. It's November 16th, uh, I believe 7 p.m. It's a Tuesday evening. Um, Pam Fessler is a wonderful writer. Uh, there's a small chance she may show up uh, at the book club. Um, she knows about it. She's reposted the flyer on her Facebook page. Um, there we go, Carville's Cure, Leprosy, Stigma, uh, and the Fight for Justice. Um, the moderator of the book group is actually Dr. Julia Benedetti, uh, who's the medical director of the clinic that uh, Leahy. Um, so I did wanna put in a plug for that as well. Um, there was a comment in the chat um, that um, uh, generally comment on the distribution of treatment meds across the globe today. Uh, Noreen mentioned she visited a colony um, in Central Africa, and it wasn't clear that the patients who spent the days in town um, panhandling were getting appropriate medicine. So um, is it true that everybody can receive proper care who, who needs it? If I could respond, um, the, the, the difficulties of, of, uh, of providing medical care in all corners of the world are, are myriad. And so the World Health Organization distributes the medicine free, uh, free of charge to all countries of the world that want it from them. The United States government uh, provides it freely to all patients in the United States and several European countries and Japan, I think, do this as well. Uh, so the medicine is sent to the country. The, whether the country can get it distributed properly to everybody is, is, a, is an open question and is sometimes very difficult. I too have been to places where the medicine should be available, uh, but it's, it's, it's in too limited supply or it's outdated or whatever. Um, so the best efforts are made to make it available, uh, but the actual distribution within each country and each state and, and so on it depends on local authorities. And so the actual experience is variable. Um, and Kathleen mentioned that the, the book is based on, uh, I just closed the chat, uh, Pam Fessler's father-in-law was a patient of Carville. Um, Eve, can I put you on the spot for a moment? Sure, Pa. Uh, to, to talk a little bit about your book of poetry. Can everybody hear Eve? I hope I didn't mute her. Could you hear me? I can hear Eve. Can other, okay. yes, go ahead. What do you want me to say? Um, how did you what get- you asking? Yeah, no, good question. Um, how did you get, what, what prompted you to um, use the, the patience of Penikes as um, material for poetry? First, it was from reading Merwin's book, uh, about the Hawaiian epidemic of leprosy and how that divided the people in the island from the English wanting to um, disrupt them. And I was so fascinated by it. Then I remembered seeing Ken Hartnett's um, documentary and was really moved by it. So I started looking for information on the island and found the, um, the book that you mentioned. Um, and it was so moving reading about these people that I wanted to give them voice, people without a voice. 
um, people that nobody knew about, nobody knew they existed. And when I started it, it was, you know, the AIDS time. So there's a parallel with AIDS. And also in my own life, at times feeling like the outcast and, and whether, without a visible stigma, but still suffering from it, particularly in childhood and as a young adult. And it was something to fixate on for a while. And I write poetry and I wanted a study to do that would that I could do and do research for, for a long time. I particularly love history. And I wanted to get to know these people. And through them, I got to know the granddaughter of one of them, Isabel Barrow's granddaughter. Uh, and that was so incredibly moving for me. I mean, I just still tear up when, when I think of you know the things that is that Joanne had said about how I gave her her grandmother. And she did not know what happened to her grandmother until she read my book and then later saw Ken's documentary and how moving that was. Well, one of the things, that, and I agree that you've, you've done a wonderful job of humanizing the patients. I don't know if you've written a poem about every single patient, but you've, you've covered most of them for sure. Yeah. Um, I also wanted, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book of um, poems is to realize the historical context, right? From 1905 to 1921, um, we went through World War I um, and of course the rise of technology. Um, and in addition, another centenary tribute is the pandemic of 1918. Uh, and you have this beautiful poem that really um, made me think, which was, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting whose perspective it was from, but essentially it turned the entire quarantine notion on its head. And it said, here we are, our own little community on our own island, and the entire world is being attacked by a pandemic. And, and please stay away, right? We are safe here from the Spanish flu and we want to stay that way. And it was a very interesting perspective on, uh, on quarantine and on infectious diseases and um, things of that nature. So I, again, I, I can't speak highly enough. Um, you've done some wonderful research. The, the poems bring these people to life, which means you're also imagining what their lives were like, but they're, they're entirely credible. And uh, I, it, it's the, the best I've seen that brings these patients to life. I'll mention Tom Buckley's book, uh, Panicky's Island of Hope. He also has short, a, a paragraph about each patient who is there, um, which are remarkably accurate. And, and we're not quite sure how he got the information about these patients, because in theory, all that information was in medical records, which sat protected um, in Dr. De Maria's office for a very long time. Um, but he was able to get information about the patients and, and again, was able to sort of tell the world who they were and, and tell some of their stories. One of my personal favorites is the Archie Thomas story that uh, Ken mentioned. Um, a, a young high school student who is very into um, radios and he essentially built his own wireless, it was called at the time, uh, and, and was allowed to communicate in real time with the outside world. So that's how the community on Penikis got information about World War I. Boats would pass by. Um, he had a handle, IZP. Um, and as soon as his story got out, uh, donations came in um, and people who were interested in that technology helped him set up ever more sophisticated um, setups. And there's a fascinating article actually about Archie in a radio journal, uh, Radio Age, I think is the journal. And the title of the article is Banished Young Radio Pioneer. Uh, and it's an eight page story. It, it's got photographs of his equipment. I don't know how they came up with these, but uh, it's a wonderful story. And actually, um, Archie died on Penikis. There were 14 patients of the 36 who died, 13 of those were buried on Penikis. One actually was buried in Boston. There's a 
the graveyard still exists and there are markers now for all of the patients. Um, but I was uh, interested to discover that the uh, Washington DC based newspaper had an obituary of Archie Thomas within days after his death. I mean, he was, he was known York, outside the island. So did the New York Times, by the way. And the New York Times. So, yeah. you know, but, again, minor, minor celebrities, um, which are also wonderful stories. I, I'm forgetting if we mentioned early on, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out um, the irony of having this exhibit at Tewksbury, because it is the site of the former state hospital who, according to the medical and legal advice of the day, should have been the place where these first five patients were sent. Uh, and doctors told them this is not a highly contagious disease. There's no medical reason you can't take these patients. The, the attorney general sent them a letter saying the law says the state hospital is where these patients belong. And they literally simply refused. And I'll, I'll quote you why their justification for not taking these patients. Um, so on October 11th, 1904, the trustees of the hospital sent a communication to the Board of Health, which had requested the patients go there, um, saying uh, at a meeting of the trustees, uh, the, the board voted unanimously that we cannot give our consent to the transfer of certain leprous patients to the state hospital as suggested in your letter. Um, we feel we should be neglectful of our duty should we consent to such transfer, thereby exposing 15 to 1800 inmates, patients, uh, more or less to that much dreaded disease. We also feel confident uh, that the, um, the action we have taken will be uh, sustained and approved by the public. So they literally use the stigma of the disease as an excuse not to take these patients. Penikes was the third choice for location for these patients. The second being, uh, I think, as was mentioned earlier, I think Ken mentioned uh, Brewster. The state purchased land in Brewster on Cape Cod, and not surprisingly, uh, people complained. After they bought Penikes, the, the residents of Cuttyhunk, right next door, also complained. But by then, the state was fed up and didn't, didn't entertain any other possibilities. So... Again, the, the stigma of the disease isn't just present in the general public, it's present in the medical community, um, as was evidenced, um, sadly, uh, uh, 115 years ago. Can I mention, Paul, that this is still true? This is, after all, a rare disease, and most doctors never see it, certainly less take in the United States. Most doctors never see it. It maybe gets two sentences in medical school, so people don't know, they don't know any more about it than, than the layman very often. Now, if you're talking to dermatologists or infectious disease specialists, it's different, but in the general uh, medical community. And so we have a continuing need to educate physicians and nurses very much because uh, even today, and even in this country, patients will be rejected by their doctor um, or their hospital. And, and, and certainly this is true in other countries all around the world. Um, so let me just mention a couple other elements of the exhibit itself. So I, I said that 15 years ago, we had a, was actually a day long seminar on disease and stigma. Um, and we're in the process of digitizing those um, lectures. There were maybe half a dozen, at least maybe more that we have digitized, including uh, Jose spoke at that um, panel discussion, uh, Dr. Julie Levison, who I don't know if you're still here, I'm not seeing you on my list, was a speaker she's written about um, uh, leprosarium in Puerto Rico uh, and has done original research there. Um, so we will soon hopefully be posting um, those lectures uh, on the Public Health Museum website as well. Um, there's a small table at the moment. Uh, there's a binder of materials on uh, Hansen's disease generally. The, um, Ken mentioned this relationship with Harvard Medical School. There was a, an official uh, research affiliation with Harvard Medical School that lasted about five years. It did coincide with additional patient deaths. Um, but the, the Dr. James Honier, a South African 
uh, physician was responsible primarily for doing the research and he published at least half a dozen articles based on his research on the patients at Penikis and those articles, copies of those articles, I should say, are part of that binder at the hospital. And I have copies, if anybody's interested, feel free to email me, I'm happy to share them. They include his letters to Dr. Walbach from uh, medical school? Uh, they don't, but they could. I, I have uh, an entire flash drive full of materials. I'd, I'd be happy to add to that binder, but um, there are some interesting uh, behind the scenes discussions as well. Did you want to say anything else about that? Can that those communications? No, he was, he, again, he, uh, he complained, you know, often about Dr. Parker and, and what he didn't do and what he should have been doing and, and how inadequate the equipment was and the laboratory was and how difficult it was. But he was suffering from a heart condition himself. He was away from the island an awful lot. But Parker got totally disenchanted with the man and uh, basically forced, I guess he forced a showdown with them. And the, because of his absenteeism, the Board of Public Charities let him go. And he went to Yale and he died soon afterwards uh, of, a, of a heart attack. He did but, actually, he was at Yale for a few years. And what's interesting is I found out recently He's buried at the Mount Auburn Cemetery in uh, in Cambridge, wow. Cambridge slash Watertown. I yeah. visited his grave there. Yeah. Um, I think he so, was kind of a classmate of Dr. Brinkerhoff, who was a, a great mystery man in this whole episode because Dr. Brinkerhoff was in Molokai mm -hmm. and, and he treated patients. He was germaphobic. So he treated patients through this double gated kind of room, you know, where he reached out through this little opening while well, his arms were all protected and did whatever he could, but he avoided all kind of contact with the patient. And anyway, he was he was had this wonderful reputation as a researcher on Molokai. And Very very interesting. I, I, your discussion about the behind the scenes um, tension between the researcher and the clinician, I, I don't know uh, how common that is currently, but I, I think that's not a surprising tension, right? Between David, David, uh, David could probably talk about that because there is probably a built in tension about somebody who's after the research target. And, and the, of the disease itself, and somebody who's after helping the patient. Well, yeah. certainly re researchers and clinicians have different objectives immediately in front of them. I don't think there's generally that much tension today as there was in the past for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, so overall, I wouldn't say that's as true today as it might have been in the past. But again, going back to what Jose said at the beginning about fear and ignorance, when, when people, including doctors, don't understand something, it's very easy to be afraid of it. And that can be leprosy, it can be tuberculosis, it can be Ebola, and it can be COVID. And, and I think that that kind of fear uh, arising from ignorance is really the common thread through all of this. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that's a good place to end. I want to, uh, again, thank everybody for, for staying. We've got about half of our audience still here. Uh, again, if anybody has follow-up questions, uh, I put my email in the chat um, a few times, iguanaphoto at gmail.com. Um, and I encourage people to visit the museum. I encourage people to, to do their own research on the subject. Uh, I'm certainly happy to help. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to leave some unanswered questions, but uh, I do want to respect the time of our panelists and, and release them to their own lives. Um, so with that, I will, I will sign off and thank everybody for their participation uh, and attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.